With the upcoming release of macOS Big Sur, Apple has finally left behind the beloved unibody MacBook Pro for good. But just because Apple has given up on these old machines doesn't mean the rest of us have. In fact, I get comments every single day from people asking which unibody MacBook to buy. So today we're gonna do a comprehensive look at every single unibody MacBook Pro that exists to determine which ones are the best to buy. Today's video is sponsored by NordPass, a powerful and secure password management system that allows you to lock away your sensitive information in a secure enclave. Do you get it? Like, you know how there's a secure enclave in the iPhone? It, never mind, just back to the video. NordPass also stores credit card information so you can log in, shop, and autofill your info with a single click. NordPass can also generate secure passwords that nobody could guess. That means no more caret1234 as your master password for every single service you use. And if that wasn't enough, NordPass also monitors for suspicious websites to ensure you don't accidentally reveal sensitive information. It works for both desktop and mobile platforms, and setup is super easy. You don't need to be a cybersecurity expert. And the best part is, sign up is totally free. Keep your passwords safe and secure by checking out NordPass with the link in the description below. The Unibody MacBook Pro was unveiled on October 14th, 2008, and was actively updated for four years until the mid-2012 variant. There are three different sizes for these MacBooks. The first model to be introduced was the 15 inch in 2008. Then in 2009, the 17 inch MacBook Pro was updated with the unibody design language and the 13 inch unibody MacBook was rebranded as the 13 inch MacBook Pro. For today, we're going to go over every single revision of the unibody MacBook in every screen size and talk about the benefits and disadvantages of each, which ones to avoid, how much to pay, and the upgrade paths available for each one. Now, just as a disclaimer before we get into this, I will have all of the recommended upgrades for these computers linked in the description below, so feel free to check those out. We're gonna start by talking about the 13-inch MacBook Pro. There are five different variants for this. The mid-2009, mid-2010, early and late 2011, and mid-2012. 2009 13-inch MacBook Pros come with either a 2.26 or 2.53 GHz Core 2 Duo, NVIDIA GeForce 9400M graphics with 256 megabytes of shared graphics memory, and can support up to 8 gigabytes of 1066 megahertz DDR3 RAM. These models can run macOS El Capitan by default, and with DOS Dude patch tools, can be upgraded through macOS Catalina. Next up are the mid-2010 MacBook Pros. These come with either a 2.4 or 2.66 GHz Core 2 Duo, NVIDIA GeForce 320M graphics with 256 megabytes of shared graphics memory, and support up to 8 gigabytes of 1066 megahertz DDR3 RAM. Natively, these things can run High Sierra, or they can go up to Catalina through patch tools. By today's standards, the 2009 and 2010 models are functionally about the same. When they were new, the difference in performance would have been noticeable, but today, frankly, there's not a noticeable difference between a 2009 and a 2010 in most cases. There's also not a ton of difference in pricing on these machines. They tend to run in the $200 range. Also, both the main bay and optical drive bay run at SATA 2, three gigabyte per second speed. So don't worry about buying the fanciest SSD because you won't necessarily be able to use all that bandwidth. The best upgrade path for both 09 and 10 MacBooks would be a 240 gigabyte SSD and the maximum eight gigabytes of RAM. I also wanna clear up a common misconception about these two years. A lot of people think that the 2009 and 2010 models have dedicated graphics, and then in 2011, Apple switched to integrated graphics. That's actually not true. Now, while Intel didn't have dedicated graphics on their Core 2 Duo processors, the NVIDIA GeForce 9400M and the 320M are not dedicated graphics. You'll notice I said they have 256 megabytes of shared graphics memory. That's because those graphics processors are integrated onto the chipset, so they don't have dedicated VRAM. 
All right, moving along to the 2011 MacBook Pros. There are technically two variants, but they're so similar, they're barely significant. So we'll treat this like one model year. You'll get these with either a 2.3 or 2.4 gigahertz dual core i5, or a 2.7 or 2.8 gigahertz dual core i7. All models will come with Intel HD Graphics 3000, and you can run up to 16 gigabytes of 1333 or 1600 megahertz DDR3. These can run up to High Sierra natively, or you can use patch tools to get up to Catalina. As far as upgrades go, I would recommend putting either 8 or 16 gigabytes of 1600 megahertz DDR3 RAM in these, and the main drive bay now uses SATA 3, 6 gigabyte per second speed, so you can use a nicer Kingston or Samsung SSD if you so choose. Now, while all the 2011s, regardless of screen size, have SATA 3 in their main drive bay, some of them also have SATA 3 in the optical drive bay, but most of them have SATA 2. So if you want to put an SSD in place of your optical drive, chances are it's going to be running at a slightly slower speed. Weirdly, there's no information as to which 2011s, regardless of screen size, have SATA 3 in the optical drive bay, so it's basically a crapshoot. As far as what you should pay for these 2011 13s, I wouldn't spend more than $300 or $350 after upgrades. And finally, we have the fanciest unibody 13-inch MacBook Pro, the mid-2012. These models will come with either a 2.5 GHz dual-core i5 or a 2.9 GHz dual-core i7, Intel HD Graphics 4000, and support up to 16 GB of 1600 MHz DDR3 RAM. These models have SATA 3 in both the hard drive and optical drive bays, just like the 15-inch 2012, so you can go hog wild with the SSD upgrades like mine, which has dual 1TB drives. The 2012 models also have upgraded wireless cards with Bluetooth 4.0, which enables a couple of features, and you can actually take the cards from the 2012s and put them into a 2011, or you can buy one of these airport cards and put them in a 2011 to give those an upgrade. Also, the 2012s run Catalina natively, so there's no need to use patch tools, although presumably when Big Sur comes out, we'll hopefully get a patch tool to allow us to continue to use these things on the newest operating system. As far as upgrade paths for these, 8 or 16 gigabytes of RAM and a 500 gigabyte SSD are great options. If you need the extra storage and want to put a terabyte in it, that's also fine, but do be wary of spending more on a machine than it's actually worth, as I've done here with my dual one terabyte build. Feel free to click on the card and check out the video where I rebuilt this Ultimate 2012. It has the full 16 gigs of RAM, dual one terabyte drives, the Core i7 processor, and we replaced every single component to restore this thing to brand new condition, thanks to help from iFixit. And I don't recommend doing that if you're shopping on a budget. This thing ended up being about $1,300. <laughs> It was a fun video though. As far as what you should pay realistically, I would try to keep it under 400 bucks for one of these because once you get above that point, especially if you're adding upgrades, you may as well buy a Retina MacBook Pro that's gonna be thinner, lighter, better display, and better battery life. So of the five 13-inch MacBook Pro models, which ones are best? Well, there's not a lot of difference between the 2009 and 2010s, and in fact, their parts are completely interchangeable. Neither have outstanding reliability concerns, so as long as you get a good deal and know that they're not going to be crazy fast, go for it. The 2011 and 2012 models are similarly interchangeable. You could theoretically buy an early 2011 and put a 2012 logic board and airport card in it and be on your way. The top cases and displays are slightly different compared to those on the 2009-10 models, so you can't swap parts between those apart from the trackpads and batteries. Personally, I'd say the 2012 is a better buy than a 2011, so it's worth a little bit of extra money, but if you find a good deal on a 2011, they're still very solid. All right, so now let's move on and talk about the 15-inch unibody MacBook Pros. There are six different variants of this one. There's the original late 2008 model, then a mid-2009, mid-2010, early and late 2011, and finally, the mid-2012. The late 2008 MacBook Pros are actually somewhat uncommon. Even though they're very, very similar internally to the mid-2009, there just aren't as many of them out there. These models will come with either a 2.4, 2.53, or 2.8 gigahertz Core 2 Duo, and are actually the first MacBook models to come with dual graphics. 
We have the GeForce 9400M with 256 megabytes of shared memory, as well as a GeForce 9600M GT with 512 megabytes of dedicated VRAM. These machines support up to eight gigabytes of 1066 megahertz DDR3, and by default they run El Capitan, but they can be updated through Catalina with patch tools. The big difference in these compared to other unibody MacBooks is that the bottom case has an access door for easy access to the hard drive battery and RAM. These models can be hard to find, but pretty affordable. Under $200 can be done somewhat easily, and you can find some pretty good deals on these things. All right, next up is the mid-2009 15-inch. Internally, there's not a ton of difference compared to the late 2008. We have either a 2.53, 2.66, 2.8, or 3.06 gigahertz Core 2 Duo, the same graphics options as before, and the same eight gigabytes of 1066 DDR3 RAM maximum. What changed for 2009 was the removal of the bottom hatch. Now we just get the iconic single plate. This also allowed for larger batteries, and they switched the express card slot out in favor of an SD card slot and an improved display with better brightness and contrast. You can find mid-2009s at around 250 bucks, which is a pretty solid price for decently usable machines. As far as upgrades for these, I'd recommend going for eight gigabytes of RAM and a 240 gigabyte solid state drive. Now, something that you have to keep in mind when shopping for MacBooks of this era, regardless of screen size, is that the processor speed really isn't going to make much of a difference. These things are all pretty underpowered by today's standards, so there's not a lot in it. Next up are the mid-2010 MacBook Pros. Unlike the 13-inch models that continued to use Core 2 Duos, the 15s switched over to Core i5 and i7s. These models come with either a 2.4 or 2.53 gigahertz dual core i5, or a 2.66 or 2.8 gigahertz dual core i7. They come with integrated Intel HD graphics as well as Nvidia GeForce GT 330M with 256 megabytes of VRAM on the i5 models and 512 megabytes on the i7s. All models support a maximum of eight gigabytes of 1066 megahertz DDR3. As for upgrades for these machines, I'd recommend eight gigabytes of RAM and a 240 gigabyte SSD. Moving on to the 2011 15 inch MacBook Pros. Once again, the early and late models are extremely similar, so we'll combine them. These models will either come with a 2.0, 2.2, 2.3, 2.4, or 2.5 gigahertz quad core i7, AMD Radeon HD 6490M, 6750M, or 6770M graphics with either 256 megabytes, 512 megabytes, or one gigabyte of GDDR5 VRAM. They support up to 16 gigabytes of either 1333 or 1600 megahertz DDR3 RAM. These models are where it gets a little tricky. They're decently powerful with quad-core processors and 16 gigabytes of RAM, but they're pretty much crippled by the graphics for two main reasons. For one, there's the infamous graphics failure problem. It's a critical flaw in the GPU that will eventually doom all of these machines given enough taxing use and heat. And you gotta keep in mind that with older MacBooks, they tend to run hotter and use more resources doing simple tasks, which means they could burn out quicker. The other problem is that even if the graphics are fine, the Radeon 6000 series GPUs do not like Catalina because they lack metal acceleration. So it's not advisable to use the Catalina patch tool unless you disable the GPU, which can be a tricky and non-permanent fix. Honestly, I would just stay away from them. Don't buy one of these. It's worth either saving money and going for something older or spending a little extra for something newer. Finally, we have the king of the unibody MacBooks, the mid-2012 15-inch MacBook Pro. These will come with either a 2.3, 2.6, or very rarely a 2.7 gigahertz quad core i7, Nvidia GeForce GT 650M graphics with 512 megabytes of VRAM on the base models and one gigabyte on the higher end CPU configurations. They support up to 16 gigabytes of 1600 megahertz DDR3 RAM and they use the newer Wi-Fi card with Bluetooth 4.0 compared to Bluetooth 2.1 EDR in the previous models. This also enables continuity and handoff features so they're very nifty to have. Additionally, both the main drive bay and optical drive bay support full SATA 3 speeds, just like the 13-inch models, so dual SSDs are a great idea. The mid-2012 15-inch really is the cream of the crop of the unibody MacBook Pros. Not only is it the most powerful, it also has the best upgrade path 
and it's the most reliable. These things are built like tanks. As far as upgrades, I would definitely recommend going for 16 gigabytes of RAM, and I would also suggest a 512 gigabyte or one terabyte SSD. And of course you can do dual drives if you so choose, but again, do be careful of spending more than the machine is worth. So finally, let's move on to the 17 inch MacBook Pro. This is kind of the odd duckling of the unibody MacBook lineup. They're, they're very strange. They didn't get updated as much. They share a lot of their specs and components with the 15 inch MacBooks, but they are a little bit harder to find and a little bit more expensive. Uh, one thing I do have to say is, as far as the design goes, these things actually have really thin bezels, like surprisingly thin considering this design is from 2009. So I think they actually look really good. The 17 inch MacBook Pro was technically updated twice in 2009, but I'm going to condense them into one because the differences are so minor. These models will come with either a 2.66, 2.93, 2.8 or 3.06 gigahertz core two duo, the same 9400M plus 9600M GT graphics combo, and the same maximum eight gigabytes of RAM as the 15 inch models from this year. The main difference is obviously the larger display with 1920 by 1200 resolution. All unibody 17 inch MacBook Pros have this display and I have to say it's really, really solid. If you line up the 13, 15 and 17 side by side, the 13 and 15 inch displays definitely look a little dated and low res, but the 17 actually feels totally modern and usable. I mean, even today in 2020, it's not by any means uncommon to find 17 inch laptops with 1080p displays. So they actually look really solid. Now, what you gotta watch out is that these 2009s have the exact same specs and performance as the 15 inch from the same year, but they carry a pretty significant price premium, usually around 350, sometimes even $400. Next up is the mid 2010 17 inch. These come with either a 2.53 gigahertz dual core i5 or a 2.66 or 2.8 gigahertz dual core i7. Nvidia GeForce GT 330M with 512 megabytes of VRAM and eight gigabytes of RAM max. For upgrades, I think eight gigabytes of RAM plus a 240 gigabyte or 500 gigabyte SSD is the smart move as these tend to cost over $400 and you really wouldn't wanna to spend too much on upgrades, especially for an older machine. Now, one thing that you do have to remember with the 17 inch MacBook Pros is that they're using the exact same hardware as the 15s, but they have higher resolution displays, which means you might notice more lagginess. You might notice lesser graphics performance because they're pushing more pixels with the same chips. And these 2010s, at over $400, you know, for that money, you could get a 2012 15 inch MacBook Pro. So the value is a little bit questionable. The final 17 inch MacBook Pro is the early and late 2011 model. These come with either a 2.2, 2.3, 2.4, or 2.5 gigahertz quad core i7, AMD Radeon 6750M or 6770M with one gigabyte of VRAM. They can support 16 gigabytes of 1600 megahertz DDR3 RAM at most, and they run up to High Sierra natively. I wouldn't recommend Mojave or Catalina on these machines because the 17s share their graphics issues with the 15 inch MacBook Pro, meaning they don't run newer OSs very smoothly and they suffer from the crippling graphics card defect, which means they're all doomed eventually. It's unfortunate because these are the most powerful 17 inch MacBook Pros that exist. And you know, if it weren't for those, those problems with the graphics, they would actually be pretty fun, solid computers. It's a little tough to recommend the 17 inch MacBook Pros because like, you know, the 2009s aren't that powerful. The 2010s are decent, but I've also heard that they've had some graphics issues a little bit more than the 15 inch MacBooks from that year. And then the 2011s are pretty significantly, dare I say, fatally flawed. So there's not really a really solid model in there. And all of them are, are very expensive, usually 50 to $200 more than a comparable 15 inch MacBook Pro. So it's definitely a little bit tricky to recommend them. For most people, I would say go for a 15 inch to maximize your value. But if you do want a fun project, something to work on, a desktop replacement to watch Netflix and YouTube on, these things can be pretty cool. 
Uh, you can't deny that their displays are really cool. The bezels are super thin. They look surprisingly modern. They're just like really cool and unusual machines that you don't see too often, but they're not the best option out there if you're trying to just buy a main computer. So between all of these different versions over the four different years of unibody MacBooks, which ones are the best options? Well, as far as the 13 inch MacBook Pro, you really can't go wrong. None of them have outstanding reliability problems. They're all perfectly fine. So if you're on a tight budget, a 2009 is more than fine. And then the, the more powerful 2012s with Core i7s like this one are also really good options. As far as the 15 inch MacBook Pros, I think the 2010s are a pretty decent sweet spot where they're not quite as anemic as a Core 2 Duo, but they're not as expensive as going for something like the mid 2012. That being said, my top recommendation would be try to find a good deal on a mid 2012 because they're really fantastic. As far as the 17 inch MacBook Pros, uh, the 2010s are okay if you can find one that's been well taken care of. The 2009s, again, are okay if you can find one that's that's a good price, but if you're looking for a main computer, I would probably avoid the 17 inch and, and go for a 15 just to be safe. So that's every single model of the Unibody MacBook Pro. These things are absolutely fantastic machines. And granted, they are getting a little bit older. You're not necessarily going to be able to use a lot of these for like, editing 4K raw, you know, that's not what these things are for. But as budget MacBooks, these things are great options. They've got a ton of upgrade paths. The parts are readily available. Parts for these things are everywhere and they're very, very affordable. The displays are like 50 bucks if you crack one. Like there are a ton of options for repair and upgrade. So these things are really fantastic if you're looking in that sort of two to $400 price point. Hopefully this video helped you understand some of the differences between the different types of unibody MacBooks, as well as maybe helping you decide which one you want to go for. If this video did help you, don't forget to leave a comment down below, subscribe, leave a like, and check out any recommended parts in the description. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Luke Miani and check out my subreddit, which is also linked down below. Also, for any of you guys who are interested in watching uh, more live streams, I have made a Twitch channel and you'll find that linked in the description as well. And with that, I'll see you all in the next video.